Well, hello, everybody. This is Chris Dew with E1 Solutions, and I'm glad you're joining us for the seventh in the series, uh, our Smart List Trek series. And this one is is kind of focused on the, the next the next generation, if you will. Um, and we're going to talk today about moving from Dynamics GP when you're ready to do that and how you can still access that historical data that you maybe have had for 5, 10, 20 plus years. So that's kind of the focus of today's session. Um, I thought I'd maybe start with a little story. Um, I've been in the space for, it's getting really close to 27 years now that I've been either working for Great Plains or Microsoft or E1 Solutions. And again, most of the time has been focused around um, some kind of either customization or integration or reporting uh, capacity. But what I wanted to talk about just real briefly is when I started almost 27 years ago, one of the things that we were helping people with was a transition from, at the time was called GPA or Great Plains Accounting to Dynamics. And that was, again, for a lot of people, uh, something that was a very hard transition, but some people were, were doing that. And some of the same issues, right? Moving from one system to another, um, everything wasn't necessarily perfect all the time. And so there's a lot of things that we're gonna discuss today, right, that, that happen no matter, again, if you did it 25 years ago, or like I said, five years ago, or maybe there's some of you on here that are, um, they, you know it's in your future, but it's, it's still maybe a year out, maybe it's two, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10 years out. So there's those some things that as you're, you're getting into those uh, conversations at your company, hopefully we'll give you the tools at E1 to, to help you along on that journey. Again, today we're, we'll just have um, a fairly short agenda. We're gonna spend a, a fair amount of time on some of these, these areas, but basically I wanna talk about what is the problem with with accessing our, our historical data access, right? When when you say at some point in time, I, I am moving on from Dynamics GP, but how do I get at, at my data? So what is the problem? Um, we're gonna get into some terms that, that uh, again, may be less familiar, who we just will we'll provide some additional definition and dig in on some of those things. And then we'll really talk about uh, the solution to how do we access that history. And then as a bonus, we will, We'll talk about, you know, whatever system you're going to, how we can make sure that that data is not available, not a, not only available inside of PopDoc, but available in those other systems as well. All right, so let's dig in. What is the problem, right? It's a historical data problem. And like I said, in the first story we talked about, this happens time and time again, no matter wherever you go, not all of your data is going to make that trip. And so again, I can hardly think of a system that's that's one for one that all of your history is going to make it over there. Um, I think another thing too, the kind of the second point on this slide is that it may not be desirable to bring all data. And let's talk about a couple of situations there. There are some situations where again, maybe you have 20 years of of data. And if you bring all that over, um, maybe you're gonna have additional costs, right? In the new system, maybe there's a storage, if you're going to a cloud-based system, maybe there's some storage costs because of an overage or, or something like that. Sometimes it may not be a, a monetary cost, but maybe it's a performance cost, right? If you're bringing in huge amounts of data, um, it may make all of your, your new system a lot slower. So, and some of that some of that data may not be nearly that meaningful anymore right 20 20 years ago maybe you know, the world's changed just a, a little bit in, in in the last 20 years maybe some of that information just is isn't as relevant anymore in your product offerings or whatever it may be um i think a, another thing too right is that you may only want to bring, maybe you have a regulatory compliance that it's the last seven years or three years or 10 years or whatever it is. So you may only want a portion of the historical data to access. Additionally, um, 
I think here's one of the biggest issues is that um, when you go to a new system, it is a chance to um, kind of evaluate how you did it the first time and do changes need to be made, right? So maybe I think one of the, the most common ones is um, is really like an account restructuring. Right there, there's there's a lot of times that some of the newer systems you're going to, um, they're going to have more d dimensions. Where, whereas like Dynamics GP had segments for your accounts, you're now going to have dimensions. And um, and again, maybe you're taking this time to restructure how you do all of that. Or again, there's a lot of people will restructure the way they do their their vendor IDs or their customer IDs or things like that. This is a time to do a lot of those things. And so, you know, one of the other problems is making sure that you can connect to to that data um, and find that history, even though it's an old system. So oftentimes there's kind of like a translation in there that's really, really important. So um, that's one of the biggest problems right that we're we're trying to solve today like how do we get access to the history when it, it's not in the new system that we're we're at so that's that's what we're going to be uh, digging into a little deeper here today okay so there's a couple terms i want to just briefly um, bring up in, in this conversation because again, maybe some of you have seen some of the other sessions or may, maybe you're jumping in here and, and need to go back and see some of the other sessions that we're doing on the smart list trek. But two quick ones I wanna bring out and then we're gonna spend a little bit more time on one of them a little later. When we are talking about connecting to Dynamics GP data, right? It was we have to make sure that we have a secure way of accessing that. And so one of the things we're, that people use is a gateway. And now I guess basically a gateway makes it that we're not directly on your SQL server. You don't have to be there. Some people will choose to put it on there, but basically it is, um, it's installed on your network and then we just communicate with the gateway and then the gateway itself communicates internally on your network, on your network to your SQL server. So that's one of the things we talk about for secure um, access. Another thing we're gonna talk about today, uh, again, it's not the entire solution, but we're gonna spend a fair amount of time on Azure Data Lakes. And you might say, what is an Azure Data Lake? Basically, an Azure Data Lake is, is simply a, a storage mechanism out in the cloud, and it allows us to store unstructured data. So what does that mean? Well, if we talk about GP, right, GP had all these tables. Uh, that you know all the data was stored in all the columns were exactly what GP was expecting or again maybe if you had some third-party products or uh, something like that you know they might have additional tables where stuff was stored but an Azure data lake is a little more open you can store a CSV file next to a JPEG next to a Word document <laughs> next to whatever so we can store all kinds of stuff out there it's very loose and and that's one one of the exciting things it's a it's a great way of, of storing that information in a in a very cost effective manner and we're going to kind of tap into that a few more times uh, in this conversation today because we have the capability of, of storing large amounts of data out there and accessing it um, really at very very reasonable prices so that's certainly one of the things cost effective but when we start talking about some of the other the other areas um, that are really important is that when we get into um, like documents so a lot of people you know maybe we're doing attach document attach inside of dynamics gp well, what happens? How do I still get access to those documents? So we have something with PopDoc that will allow us to basically extract that document out, place it into the data lake and make that available to you. So there's just a couple things. And again, like I said, we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper um, on some data lake stuff in a bit, because I think there's still a lot of mystery for, for people and really what that is. Okay, so sorry, I was gonna show this um, just very briefly, just this this gateway is essentially just a way for us to, 
to provide a secure mechanism because because PopDoc is hosted in the cloud, right? It is an Azure-based solution, and so we need a way of calling into your um, GP data securely. So, PopDoc is a solution we're talking about, and I wanna talk about three different scenarios here, and then we're gonna start digging into these, these scenarios uh, a little bit more. First one, we if you want to, maintain a SQL server, right? So you have your GP server today that, that has all of your GP data. If you want to maintain that for, you know, whatever, how many ever years <laughs> to come and that you need to access that data, that is one option, right? PopDoc can bring that information in. The beautiful part, you get all of your smart lists, you get all your, um, you'll get all your favorites from your smart list, you'll get anything built in smart list builder, or, or even baby smart list builder, the designer. So you would get access to all those things as well as access to views and tables and everything like that. So you can basically make any of that data available if you want to maintain that, that SQL server. What I'm hearing more and more though from um, you know the hundreds and hundreds of people that are that are starting this this trek from from GP to uh, you know other solutions is that they don't really want to maintain that SQL server forever, right? They they want to have a point in time where we are done using it, and now I want to be able to access the data in the cloud, but I don't want that IT burden of of keeping that running uh, locally. So. Um, I'll talk about one other scenario here. There is something inside of, um, well, th there are a few different solutions out there that really will host a GP. So we've had some people that actually have moved it to one of those solutions, maybe have a single user, just so somebody that can you know, log in or whatever and, and access that data. And even um, like uh, Ingevity has a, I think it was a Dynamics, Power GP online. That's another one where they've actually put a whole API around it that that PopDoc can call into. So that's that's one example of you know an hosted solution where we can hook into that data. And again, we can still make that available um, in another system. But then it's something that you're no longer um, maintaining that 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 server um, anymore. I guess maybe one other point too is on the first one. There are some people that have basically put their whole GP database into they like, can Azure SQL so that again they aren't maintaining it anymore on on site that it's just running on on Azure's services. But the last one we're going to spend quite a bit of time on here today is basically in PopDoc we have a way of moving this data to an Azure data lake so it's again now being stored in a cost effective manner. You can still access all that data, and then we now can surface it wherever that that is going to be. So we're going to get into those um, those situations, I think, right now. So let me switch my screen here. Okay, so we're going to start by going inside of. Uh, inside of a Dynamics, well, sorry. Okay, so this is this is the PopDoc web application, but I think what I want to do is I want to start by showing you embedded in another system, being able to access historical GP data. So I'm gonna show it the first, uh, the first area that we talked about. So I'm going, I'm using Business Central for this first example here. If we look at this, um, you can see we basically have kind of the equivalent of your smart lists. These are actually, this first list is a default business central list. But I wanna point out is you can see if I go down here, I have some GP lists. Now this is the first option, right? Where I have a direct connection to my data, right? So if I wanted to see you know, some of my account transaction history, you can see now it's no longer hitting a BC company, it's saying, what GP company do you want to use? So I can do that, and now I'm pulling uh, the account transaction history 
um, from my historical GP, but it's hitting that SQL Server directly. And when I say directly, I'm, I mean through like a, a gateway, for example. So um, what I want to do is, is just, I guess, I'm going to show you what does that look, what does that setup look like in, in this example. So if I were to add a brand new Dynamics GP connector here, you'll see we have some options. Um, and I'm talking about using like a gateway here. So this is where you would set up a gateway. So now we don't have to put in any of that that uh, SQL information. It's just basically pointed to that and then your token authentication. But again, we do have that you can, if, if you have made that port available, uh, open to the, you know, to PopDocs uh, IP addresses. A lot of people will whitelist the IP addresses instead of creating a gateway. That's another option for you as well. You'll just see that you have a slightly different setup. But I'm t I was talking about like in this case, hitting the gateway and and pulling pulling that data directly. So that's what's happening right here. Is right we're we're pulling data directly from that SQL Server. And again, as long as you keep that SQL Server running. Um, you know, you'll be able to access this historical GP data uh, if you want. So that's the first option. Um, the second one we, we talked about, like uh, a power power GP was one example I gave out. But again, you'll have different scenarios there, where whether it's, you know, hooking into like their web services or again, we have a dedicated connector for power GP, but that is an option. So I kind of want to go and spend some time on this this third option with an Azure data lake. So what I want to show you here is if I, since we're inside of here, um, I'm going to, this is stuff that's been moved to a data lake. So it's no longer on a SQL server that it doesn't require that SQL server is live. I'm able to pull some information um, from the Azure data lake. Now, this is kind of an interesting list. You can see in this example here, we have 1,200 lines. Um, but didn't I just tell you that this was historical Dynamics GP data? Well, it is. Um, but what I want you to see is if we look at these first lines, it's actually pulling information from two different places. So these first records are actually coming from the live Business Central system, which is in this example where, I, where I'm pulling it from. But if I go a few hundred records in and scroll down, we can see it changes, right? These are now ones that were stored into an Azure data lake. And so we have the capability with PopDocs custom lists to bring in the data from the new system and the archive system that's sitting in an Azure data lake and give you one list that has all of that information together. So, for me, this is this is where it gets real, right? Is because now we have the capability of of pulling one one source of truth to to see all of the in, in this example, all of the history for your for your customers. So let's take it to the next level. What might that look like, right? This is all of the history, but is that really how you want to see it? I now have a record, our good old buddy Aaron Fitz, who, who made made the transition from, from GP to, in this case, Business Central. Um, but you can see we have PopDoc embedded once again on here. And this is only has a couple records coming from the new system and most of his history, he only has 124 line items, is coming from Dynamics uh, GP now, right? So. So I just want to get you some ideas on how you can do that. So let's we're gonna we're gonna take a little journey on how to set this up because this has been one of the best options for people going going forward. So I said we dig deeper into the Azure data lake. I want to do that now, and um, we're actually gonna we're gonna go really deep because I'm gonna show you how you actually would set one up, and I'm gonna do it kind of a unique way because there's so many people say, well, what are the costs, you know, or, or how scary is it? Like what, what, what kind of, what should I expect? And so I kind of want to walk through that process with you. So if I go to this Azure pricing calculator, um, I can click on this. It's essentially a storage account is what an Azure data lake is. We can see it down below. 
and um, we're going to watch this this little number because this number is going to change and I want you to understand um, by the end of this what I'm telling you is that most of you that have less than a terabyte of data are going to be able to get by for under $20 a month so that's what we're going to talk about right now okay so the first thing that you're going to be greeted with it's going to say where is this located now if you are in the united states um, currently we are serving everything out of one azure data center and that is in the north central us so that is where you're going to ultimately want to place the um place it because you're going to get the fastest performance when we're reading that data the other part here is that we're going to recommend that you pick the data uh, that sorry the data lake storage generation 2 that gives us the capability of of everything that we need to to, to put it in there properly now you'll see the next thing to greet you is whether it needs to be premium or standard um, I have done a lot of testing on this and I really have not um, in in the size that we have and again we have under a terabyte uh, usually with all this testing that we've been doing um, I haven't seen any performance benefits for premium so um, for again unless you have 100 terabytes of, of GP data storage I think you're going to be just fine with standard you'll see just like that it went down to $22 a month, right? So we went from 180, it was just a second ago, now it's down to 22. Um, this is gonna be general purpose. Now this is one people think it potentially could get cheaper um, if they went to do different, different options here. I'll actually show you something shocking. It actually goes up. <laughs> Even <laughs> uh, archive, right, which is actually gonna be slower storage and everything like that, it actually like triples the price. So. I recommend hot storage is going to give you the fastest access to data um, and again everything you need now this is another thing that moves the needle um, and this is kind of an interesting one this LRS is locally redundant storage which basically means Microsoft is going to store this in your Azure account at the same um, the same location right the same data warehouse and so they'll have a backup of it the only potential problem, right, is if if Microsoft's uh, storage facility, um, you know, whatever, uh, went on fire, um, you could potentially lose that data, right? So that's where some people will choose more of a globally redundant instead of a locally redundant storage so that then they would have it uh, stored at another, or I should say, sorry, I said global, I meant geo, so that it could actually be stored at another geography and then they could store it there. So that's the one thing that will will move the needle, right? You can see it doubles it if, if you have it stored somewhere else as opposed to uh, the backup being stored at the same facility. Okay, the next thing that does move the needle is this file structure. And we are gonna be putting stuff in multiple folders. And so that's what we need for a hierarchical namespace. Say that five times real quick. But you will see that that almost doubled the price right there. Um, just being able to to put that information again in inside of a folder structure as opposed to just a bunch of files all, all at once. Okay, so then we start getting into uh, the details of this. You can see this is for a terabyte of storage a month. Now I would venture to say that most of you, especially after we um, clean some stuff up and everything like that, it is not going to be a terabyte of storage. So let's say you had 100 gigabytes. That should uh, cover, I'd say, 90% of, of the people probably on this call. Now you can see we're down to $33 a month, even though after we'd, we'd gone up and down. But look at this. I mean, that top part is, is only costing us two. There's only this bottom part is where it's 31 $31, right? So all the transactions and all that stuff, this is a ton of, of you know, tens of thousands of, of transactions um, for reading and writing. Now, again, writes, um, you're only going to write this, you're mainly going to be writing it when you're moving it from GP to, 
to uh, the data lake. And so that's kind of a one-time thing, but you can see it's it's nothing. And reading it, um, you, you know, you can read it tens of thousands of times every month and it's gonna cost nothing. So what does cost the bulk of this? And this is where things are kind of weird, right? This basically nothing, some of, the, some of these things that we don't really need to get into, but then here's the weird one, metadata storage. <laughs> This is essentially the storage of the file structures and the folder structures. Well, we don't have a terabyte of that, uh, right? We, we're not, we don't even have a terabyte of, of data in here. And so even if you said it was one gigabyte, which would be a humongous amount of storage, right? We're talking three cents. So when I, when I tell you by the end of this, for most people, you're gonna be under $20. Um, I think you'll be able to see that that actually is the case. So what I wanted to do next is basically take the little exercise we went through and show you that this can actually, inside of Azure, when you're setting up this account or your partner is or whoever it is, is setting it up inside of your Azure uh, storage. And, and maybe that's one little point to make. Everything we do uh, at E1 and on the PopTalk side is to make sure that your data is secure and that you have control over it. We don't ever store your data. So this is something that's stored in your account and you're basically just granting PopDoc the access to, well, in this case, we're gonna be we're gonna be writing to it as well, but then primarily going forward of just reading that data out of there. So if we look at, again, setting this up, um, I, I need to give it a name. And I'll call it GP demo. <laughs> Uh, what's today? Eight, oh, nine, September, nine one, nine one. Can I not have, okay. So GP demo nine, we'll call it. Um, you can see, I've talked about the region. So this should be uh, in, North, the North Central. Come on. Oh, because this will be the fastest access. Like I said, standard um, is is good. Even Microsoft says it's good for most scenarios. Um, and then this is that redundancy, right? We talked about locally redundant versus geo redundant. So all we need is the local. We hit the next button. The only key thing here is this enable hierarchical namespace, right? This is what allows us to store the folder structures. So basically there's a few other options here and there, but that's all it is to, to set up an Azure account. So in 30 seconds, you can have an Azure data lake at your disposal. So then I guess what I'd like to go into is what, what does that look like? So I'm gonna take you inside of one that I have already created. If we look at the settings, it's really simple to hook into. So I'm using this E1 demo data lake. There is something called a container, right? We can have different um, pieces of data. So this this container called demo is where we're storing all of our stuff. And then you basically have this key and the format we're using is gonna be a CSV in this case. But if we start looking at this, where is the power of this? This is what really makes your life a lot easier because we can basically, um, I can choose to upload the lists that I want. Now this is important. Um, if you only need, you know, account transaction history, maybe some sales line item history, maybe some purchase purchase history, uh, a few things like that, you only need to move those lists. If you need to move everything, we have some provisions for you to do that here. But I'm gonna talk about why this may be valuable. So this is hooked directly into a GP connector, which gives us a lot of things already so i can basically say hey i want to move and uh, you know we'll just we'll go with sales we've been talking about that a little bit today so i want to move sales line items for example now here's what's important i can move everything and this sales line item list has hundreds and hundreds of columns in there right some of them you may never ever use 
again, in the scenario where we talked about, maybe you have 20 years of GP data. Do you want to move 20 years or do you have a favorite that's been saved on this list already that has filtered it down to the last seven years? Or again, in my example here, just the last year, right? Those are the kinds of things that you can you can do. So if you only want to move a subset of the data, again, if you're not going to use all 400 columns that are in that list, if you're only going to use 30 fields, right, that's all you would ever search on, you don't have to store all that extra stuff. Um, so you have some nice options here. In this example, I'm just going to move everything to show you. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to create a new list called this. So just so we can have it for today, it's nine, nine, one. Here, I'll put 2022 on that. And I'll put it here just so we know exactly which list. And then the last part I want to talk about is we give you some options and mainly I'll focus on this, this initial area here. We have a default way which attempts to optimize the way of moving the data um, in, in an efficient manner, right? So if you have 10 million transactions in, in your GP, you know, let's call it sales line item history, we want to make sure that um, it doesn't necessarily bring your SQL server down when we try to request all of them. And so we basically bite it off smaller chunks at a time. And so that's what we call it with chunking. So we attempt to do it on our own, uh, picking an efficient way, but you still have the capability of doing a custom way of doing this, which allows you to then, um, again, basically pick any field that you want to, to get smaller chunks of data to go through. And then basically we put them all together uh, for you. I'll go with the default on this one. The last things I will talk about though, is that we give you some additional ways to further optimize the way the data is stored, right? So if we have like a lot of GP tables, a lot of the string fields are blank and they're actually taking up data storage. Um, that's just kind of the way GP does it, right? They pad out everything. So if it was supposed to be 30 characters, and you don't have anything stored in there, it's still storing it as 30 characters. Well, we have a way of getting rid of all of that information. So it's not storing that and making the file bigger or making you pay for it in, in the data lake. Same thing with date fields. Now this is kind of more of an interesting one because if you guys have ever looked at um, how, it's, how GP stores dates a lot of times, is if it is a date field, there's also a time component. And they store that with a blank time, or if it's a time field, they store the date as 1-1-1900. And even if there is no value in there, it gets stored as 1-1-1900 at 12 o'clock. So that's a meaningless date, right? It's essentially a blank date, but all that data is in there. So we, we know that, and again, we'll strip all that out so that it's not just putting a bunch of extra junk and making that file big. So let me start this process. And what I'm gonna show you in just a second here is that we have a way of tracking where that's at. Now, this is kind of interesting. Here's the one that we just did. It fired off three processes. Why did it do that? Well, I happen to have three GP companies. So we we have you know customers that have 10 companies. We had one that had 70 companies and they only wanted to move 50 of them. So you can do stuff like that as well. You can choose which ones you want to archive. But you can see what is happening right now is that if I hit refresh on this, um, I can see that this company didn't have any records. If I do the same here, Oh, this one is, hasn't given me that yet. <laughs> um, this one also doesn't have any records. So it's it must be just completing that. And okay, there we go. So that one doesn't have any records. If we look at this one though, we can see this one it has chunked. It's basically came up with 58 different chunks and it's adding all of those uh, together and should be done shortly. While we're waiting for that to finish though, I wanted to talk to you about the companies. Right here is the, the companies that, that came from GP. So again, if you said, hey, the threes company in this case is one that we, um, it was just a test company. We don't need to archive that. We can get rid of that. So you can, you have some control over that. But what I wanna show you is that not 
only do we have the capability of doing individual lists, we also have the capability of moving the entire database. And what I call this really is the insurance policy. The first one is probably the one that you're gonna use, right? It gives you everything you need. It gives you more, basically the same smart list, the, the names, you know, the favorites, all those kinds of things. It, it gives you that as it, as it brings it over. And it gives you the human readable names. This is a little different. This says, hey, we're gonna go to your GP database and we're gonna archive the entire database. Now, it doesn't do just the GP tables. It's gonna do, if you have custom tables in there, third-party tables, anything like that, it's gonna move all of that information to the data lake. So again, if I were to take, for example, if I did this, it would move my two companies and then also my Dynamics database. It would move all three of those and all of the tables inside of there. Now, we have one other option. I, I, we talked about these other options before on skipping, you know, string fields, date fields, number fields, but there's a new one here. This says don't upload empty tables. This is really powerful too, because guess what? If you're only using GL, AR, AP inside of GP, you maybe not are not using all 2,500 tables that are in there. And so why would you have a bunch of, why would you have 2,000, or probably, probably 2,400, why would you have 2,400 empty files? That's just wasted space and, and uh, you know, structure to throw up there. So we have an option to say, you know what? We're going to go through, and if there is no data in any of those SOP tables or POP tables or manufacturing tables, we're not going to bring those up there. It doesn't, it's not needed. So we've done some really nice things like that to optimize it as well. The other thing is that you can, this is to, again, just kind of set it and forget it, saying, hey, I'm ready. We're no longer using GP anymore. Everything's been moved to the other system. I'm ready to archive it and then turn off my SQL server. This is the great last step that you can move all of it and then you have that insurance or assurance in this case that you can access any kind of GP data that you need to in the future. And you can even, if you didn't want to do a whole database, you could say, hey, I'm, I'm moving uh, just a, a, single, a single table and have that same kind of um, experience. If we go back to this upload history, I should be able to look at this and this one has been completed. Right, so we've successfully loaded that. So what I wanna show you is, if we look, go ahead and look at our, this is the data lake I used, and pick Fabricam, and 9-1-2022, that's what we called it. We have a new list in here. Now this is not hitting GP anymore. This is hitting the data lake. It looks and feels just like all my GP data, right? If I wanna pull everything inside of here, we can do that. And there we go, we're pulling all 983 lines. You still have the same capabilities of adding uh, columns, right? So if we want those aging buckets, we can do that. And then you can see, right, we brought in all of the columns from <laughs> that really big list. So this is awesome that you can now access that history and that SQL Server can be turned off. And so you, you still have access to that. All right, I think I think I'm just going to go to one more one more slide here, and then we'll we'll talk just a little bit about the next the next area. So there's kind of the three areas that we talked about. Okay, so this next one is really, I think, one of the most important parts. It's great we've we've given you a tool to connect to your GP data extract it if you want to move it to you know azure data lake but then again the next question is how do i access it in the new system that i've gone to right some of you have maybe stayed inside of the microsoft family or are going to stay in the microsoft family so you might be using business central or maybe uh, uh, fno um, those are some options for you there some of you are gonna venture outside of the GP space, right? If, if you're looking at going to Acumatica or Intact or NetSuite, you still have the same capabilities of being able to see all of that GP history 
in other systems. So what we're talking about, PopDoc gives you those tools to embed it in other systems without needing to write code, or sometimes there may be there may be a small amount of code to, to grab values off of the whatever window or page that we're pulling it from so that we can filter it down, kind of like the example I showed you earlier with Business Central. So let's um, let's go ahead and, and talk just a little bit more about that. Oops. So how we set that up is if I was going to, if we're going to take this list right here and I wanted to make this, this one list available in some other system, we have a section here called widgets that allow us to, to do that. I'll just call it GP migrate here for now. Um, we have a ton of different types. I'm not going to focus on that today, but let's just say we're going to grab one single list. So I'm pointing to connector. Instead of a GP connector now, though, I'm pointing to the data lake connector. So because I don't, I'm going to turn that SQL server off. So that's, that's an important part. I'll pick this as my default company, and then we're going to pick this new list that we just uploaded. If I had created some additional favorites, right, you might make a favorite that has, you know, just this year, last year, last quarter, whatever. Whatever those favorites may be, you can put all those on there. Those will still um, flow into here. You have control over the fields you want to see. This is just going to pull the defaults uh, that were on there. Um, we talked about parameters. You can basically pass in a parameter to filter it down. So if it was just for a particular customer or maybe it's a date filter or something like that, we can we can do that. We can choose what we want to see, right? So if we want to allow exporting to Excel inside of there, we can we can do that. If we want to, you know, see filters and all that fun stuff, we we have control over how we want to look at it. And then this is the fun part we can see a preview. Now, this is just kind of our generic one. It gives us that, you know, everything we need, right? Like I said, we can export to Excel from here. We can, uh, you know, add any of the columns. We can filter it down as much as we like. But if you're going to embed it in some other system, right? So if we were going to embed it inside of Business Central, you'll see this is what it looks like. Even though this is, this is historical GP data, it now looks like the system that we're going to put it in. Or again, if you were going to do it on the NetSuite side of things, I could do the same kind of thing. And now this is going to look and feel like NetSuite as we put it inside of there. So, and then basically the next step is we we do give you some some of these things you don't even have to know about, but we give you everything you need inside of here to to see how to embed it, whether it's um, you know an iframe or if you're putting it inside of a NetSuite or Salesforce or, or whatever. We'll generate generate all the code for you and then you can just copy it in. So since I mentioned NetSuite, let's jump out there, right? Because we, we've kind of stayed within the Microsoft family and like I said, not everybody is, is going to do that. So if I go ahead and click on the PopDoc tab here, what I want to show you is PopDoc is now embedded inside of um, NetSuite in this case. And again, this first list looks and feels native to NetSuite, but it's pulling NetSuite uh, data. That's not what we're after. We're after our GP history. So now I have a very similar list that I did inside of Business Central where I had historical GP and new Business Central. Well, I've done the exact same thing here. And here I pulled up one of my favorites I had inside of here for only Aaron Fitz's transactions. So we can see Aaron Fitz, pri Aaron Fitz primarily has GP history, right? 111 of those records came from GP um, that we had moved to the data lake, but then it has two records, two basically two line items that were entered inside of, of NetSuite. So now I have, again, both the history and the new transactions for this particular customer and inside of that system. So just showing you that, again, I think a key part of this is wherever you're going, like I said, whether it's Acumatica or Intact or, or um, NetSuite or, again, other, other Dynamics options from Microsoft, we have a solution for you to be able to access that data. 
And again, like I said, if we hit the export button, there we go. Now we have we have those um, those orders are are directly. Oh, let me go pull it from my other screen here. Didn't do it fast enough. Okay. <laughs> so there we go. There's the file that we we just dumped out with all of all of our data, and it even. This is kind of fun. It even has the calculation for the subtotal. So if you want to get rid of a couple of those lines, send it off, send this list of invoices off to the customer for their history. You can do that. It automatically calculates it. So just, I think this, those are some of the, the amazing things that we can bring whatever data you need, whether, like I said, whether it's sales history, purchase history, uh, financial transaction history, we can give you that capability of pulling pulling that in together. And even if you have done some of those more challenging things like um, changing the account structure, right? Or changing your vendor IDs, customer IDs, we can provide a translation in the middle to, to handle scenarios like that. Okay, let's wrap it up here. I have just a couple more slides. Um, just to kind of recap, this is, you made it. If you've watched all of them, congrats. You made it through all seven of these uh, SmartList Trek training series. If not, the, there's some really great resources, to, again, to help you today if you're using SmartList Builder to help you um, as you maybe are looking at making your GP data available to people outside of your network. PompDoc is a great tool to ha make that happen. Or again, if we're moving beyond GP where you're saying, hey, we have we have a limited amount of time that we're gonna we're gonna be staying on GP and I want to be able to still access that information, we have the tools for you to, to handle that as well. Okay. So let's get into any questions that we have out there. It looks like I have one right now. So again, I'd encourage you to use the questions pane if you do have some additional that you'd like to ask. Okay, this one's got a few words. Let me read this one real quick here. Okay, so um, question was, does PopDoc support binary stream mem or multi-entity management? Uh, it looks like there's some more details on they're moving from that implementation to kind of moving it into separate databases and, and want, to, want to make sure that they can handle matching up the historical data. Um, yes, you should be able to, because basically that information um, either Either with a smart list or or a view, you should be able to to match up those those. I think there's like basically two two pieces of information: the whole the the entity management piece that are attached to each transaction, and so that could be basically like a translation. You you can have that to say that you know where where it said this before. This is now represented in this company. So yes, there. There is a way that we could pull that information together, even in your scenario where you're staying on GP for for the foreseeable uh, history, but but have kind of a <laughs> a slightly different implementation going on. That's absolutely something that we can pull together. Yep, good question. Okay, I got another question asking, how far back can you go? Um, I'm guessing that's GP version. Well, what I would say to this is that um, we've done you know a ton of testing on GP 2010 on up, and so the the only thing that we you know have have focused on is is your smart lists right. There hasn't been too many data data model changes with your smart lists in, in the you know since since that 2010 time frame, um, but that's really the only thing that. Um, could be a couple tweaks. We're, we're never stuck because we can go at the SQL database level. So uh, even if the smart list and match 100% on some of those older versions, you could still get out that data and, and make sure that we could archive it. Um, okay, there's another question here on, are there any lists of limitations on data types that could be migrated? Okay, example in this case was blob type data that's stored in a custom GP table um, being made 
accessible to PopDoc. Yeah, some of the, we have purposely ignored a lot of the, the, the blob tables themselves. That being said, I, I did mention document attach. So I know there's a number of people that are using that feature. And so we do have the capability of actually um, a couple of things. If you're hooked into GP, we can actually, we have a, a detail section. So you can, you can see the attachments and download them, even though you're in the web. So we, we've given you that, even though those are, those are kind of stored as a blob, but we have, we basically, we know that special scenario and we can make those attachments available. But if you have done, um, some other types of, of data in a blob, we, we don't necessarily know the format of, of what's in there. And so we have most often chose to ignore, um, ignore those kinds of things. So if you have a specific scenario, I'd, I'd be interested in, in learning more what, what you are storing in a, maybe it looks, looks like it might be a custom custom GP table. So if you could tell me more about what you're storing there, we could I'd be happy to follow up with you on a conversation on that. Good question. Okay, last call for questions. While I'm looking to see if there's any more, I'll just throw up the last um, screen here. Just wanted to say thank you for attending today. We got an awesome crew. Um, you can see most of them on the right. If, if you are working with your partner, uh, great. Or if you're a partner that needs to hook up with your account manager, we got a lot of awesome people that are willing to help out. Or again, if you just want to send message into sales at E1 Solutions, we have you covered there as well. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now, and, and maybe maybe I'm getting a, a, um, a comment typed up right now with a little more details on the last one. But I wanna thank everyone for their time, and if you do have some, some more questions, again, feel free to send us a message at any of those, and we'll follow up with you. So appreciate your time today, and have a wonderful rest of your day.